Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Amelia Rodarte, and I'm the Community Engagement Librarian at NC Live. And um, you're here for our latest speaker event, so thank you for joining us. Um, today's topic is Library Patron Psychosocial Needs, How Social Work Collaborations Can Help. And we are joined by Beth Waller, the Director of the School of Social Work at UNC Charlotte. So um, I'll keep my intro brief and go ahead and turn it over to Beth Waller. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amelia. Oops. Well, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to talk with everybody today. What I'm planning to do is go through the, the presentation and then there will be time at the end for any questions that, that people have. Um, so I'm going to start out by telling you a little bit about my experience and why I'm here even talking about this topic. So I am a social worker and now a social work educator and administrator and researcher, but my background experience is in practice with um, different populations that have poverty related needs, substance use disorders, mental health problems, and other barriers to economic stability and mobility. So that's sort of how I've, uh, you know, got involved with um, library social work in the first place, because many of the needs that library patrons have overlap with what my practice background was, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. I now am the director of the UNC Charlotte School of Social Work. Um, I've been in this position since uh, September of last year, and before that I was at Indiana University in an administrative and research position there. I fell into library social work really by accident, but it's been a happy accident for me. When I was working at Indiana University, I was at our Indianapolis campus. And while I was there, the Indianapolis Public Library approached the School of Social Work and asked for help and talked about all of the different things they were facing in their, uh, you know, primarily in their downtown branch of their library. And those things included people who were overdosing in the bathrooms, people experiencing homelessness who needed connected to resources, people who had um, some serious mental health issues and lots of different patron needs that were overwhelming the staff at that time. So I partnered with the library. We did a needs assessment first to make sure we really understood what the needs were. Then we piloted some practicum students who were social work master's level students in that library. We um, published about the work we were doing, we presented about the work we were doing, and after that happened, libraries started coming out of the woodwork from all across the country. So um, it now has become my primary research focus, and for the last uh, probably five or six years, I've worked primarily on um, understanding patrons' needs and specifically looking at psychosocial needs, so things like mental health, substance use, poverty-related needs. I also look at library staff needs in relation to those types of patron issues, and then different types of social work and public library collaborations to help meet each individual library's needs. I also have a consulting business that's focused on helping individual libraries with these types of needs or providing training, um, professional development around these kinds of patron needs and, and um, designing different kinds of social work collaborations to help meet those libraries' needs. So that's a little bit about my background um, and why I'm talking about this topic today. So again, I talked a little bit about psychosocial needs. I'm gonna use that term throughout this presentation. And I really mean any kind of social or psychological or environmental factor that's associated with chronic stress, chronic strain and poor health outcomes in general populations. So things like social isolation, mental health, substance abuse, and all of those poverty related needs as well. In the presentation today, I'm gonna to focus on recent research about how public libraries' roles have changed due to the growing psychosocial needs of their patrons. Um, I'm gonna talk about some research on the common psychosocial needs we do see in library patron populations, and then how social work partnerships are used to complement public library services to address these kinds of patron needs. And I'm gonna give some examples, specifically focusing on um, some smaller, you know, urban suburban areas, and then also rural libraries that have added different types of collaborations. There have been a number of historical changes that have brought about some changes just in general in the U.S. that have impacted public libraries greatly. So I want to give a little bit of context so that it's clear 
why libraries have seen changes in their patron population over the past decade or so. So one of the first things that happened that has led to some significant changes in patron population for most public libraries was the deinstitutionalization movement that started back in the 60s. So before the 60s, anybody who was thought to have a mental illness or um, you know, that, that was defined rather broadly really in that time, but anybody who seemed to have some sort of mental health challenge or mental illness was often put in a mental institution for many years and sometimes their entire lives. We knew as a society by the time we got to the 60s that that was not very helpful for most people. And that when we remove people from their social environment, we remove them from their family and friends, we remove their ability to contribute to society, to have some sort of job, um, to, to um, you know, do the things that make them happy in their lives, we actually make them worse. So because of that, the move came, movement came about in the 60s to release people from mental institutions into the community and the federal government put money into community mental health services to try to meet these um, individuals' needs in the community. What happened though, is that there has never been enough money to actually pay for adequate amounts of mental health services for the population of people that do have chronic and persistent mental health challenges. There also has not ever been enough money or enough resources for the wraparound services that someone needs like housing or job assistance. So this brought about a huge increase of people in most of our communities who are experiencing chronic mental health problems and now are homeless or having trouble um, you know, supporting themselves and getting adequate mental health care as well. After that, the Great Recession and the mortgage crisis that happened in 2007 to 2009 also brought an increase in people who are experiencing challenges related to poverty. Um, there long has been a shortage of emergency shelter beds for people who are experiencing homelessness. And even in communities where we have adequate shelter beds, most people who are in shelter have to leave during the day and have to have somewhere to go during the day until they're able to return to the shelter in the evening. We also have increasing costs with stagnant wages. The minimum wage has been the same in our country since 2009 at $7.25 an hour. But if you look at what it actually takes to have a living wage to be able to comfortably support yourself and your family and you know, take care of all of our, our basic um, needs. In North Carolina, you actually have to have an income of $17.40 an hour. And that's if you have no dependents, if you're just a single, a single person living on their own. If you add in one child, that living wage that's required to afford basic necessities goes up to $33.52 an hour. You have two children, it goes all the way up to 42.55 an hour. So we have a huge number of people who are not making adequate incomes to be able to support their families or pay for their basic needs consistently. We also have an increase in municipal statutes in many different cities that criminalize homelessness. And again, make it so people who are experiencing homelessness have to have somewhere to go during the day because they can't necessarily um, loiter somewhere or hang out on the street or sleep on a bench. So more and more communities are passing laws that criminalize homelessness and drive people into wherever they can go for shelter during the day, somewhere to stay that's safe and, and comfortable. And then the COVID pandemic has brought an increase in mental health problems, an increase in poverty related needs, increases in you know, people having trouble maintaining employment, maintaining housing, those kinds of things. So all of these structural barriers and structural issues that are happening in the US have impacted the number of people that have high levels of need who are looking for somewhere safe to go to a day and looking for help and resources. In North Carolina specifically, there are a number of factors that impact again, the population that's gonna be coming into the public library in many cases looking for help or needing help. So we have difficulty with healthcare in this state, lack of access to mental health care in North Carolina, housing insecurity and homelessness, and then poverty. So this is a map of North Carolina, and this is a map showing the designated healthcare shortage areas in the state. And this is a designation that comes from the federal government that is based on whether there are enough providers in each county or part of the state to meet the needs of the population in that area. So the majority of the state by far is orange and the orange counties mean 
that that's a shortage area for primary care physicians, dental providers, and mental health or behavioral health providers. So most of the state does not have enough providers in these areas to actually meet the needs of the population in that area. And um, when you look at the other colors, the kind of pinkish color is for counties that have a shortage of primary care providers and mental health or behavioral health care providers. The three blue counties only have shortages for primary care providers and dental providers. And then the three yellow counties um, only have dental care shortages, but otherwise have sufficient um, providers for the population in those, in those counties. So in North Carolina, it's really a problem for many people to access health care, dental care, and mental health or behavioral health care. When we look at housing and homelessness in North Carolina, that's another huge issue in this state. So the annual point in time estimate that's done every year where, where it's, it, this is a count of the people that we can find on any given night who are experiencing homelessness. In 2020, um, there were under, there were just over 9,000 people who were homeless when the point in time estimate was done. Now, these estimates are notoriously underestimates because there are, you know, usually a, a sizable group of people experiencing homelessness who aren't able to be found and counted when this point in time count happens. Over 27,000 children in North Carolina Carolina public schools experienced homelessness during the 2019-2020 school year. Um, for people who actually um, have housing or are looking for housing or have an income to be able to afford housing, there aren't enough rental homes in North Carolina by far to meet the needs of um, people who have lower incomes. So in this state, we actually have a shortage of almost um, 200,000 rental homes for people who have low income. So it's a huge shortage of affordable housing for people. Um, of North Carolina residents who are actually in housing, there's a sizable number that are paying over half of their income to just be able to afford that housing. So when we look at the total number of renter households in the state, 25% of rental household, households are considered extremely low income and 69% of that group are paying more than half of their income to be able to afford housing. So when you have somebody that's paying that much on housing, they're having to sacrifice other things. They may not be able to pay for medication. They may not be able to pay for healthcare, childcare, transportation, other kinds of things. And many of the counties in, this, in the state of North Carolina are ranked highly on county distress rankings. So when we look at um, poverty rates in the state alone, just under 13% of the population in North Carolina is actually below the, at or below the federal poverty guideline, um, which for 2021, um, which is when this um, number comes from, the 12.9% that we're experiencing, um, that we're living below the poverty line was from 2021. For that same year, to be at or below the poverty line, the poverty guideline, that means that a family of four was making 26500 or less. So again, if you think about what I was talking about earlier with the living wage, there's a huge group of people that aren't captured in this statistic because they were making more than the federal poverty guideline, but there's still this huge gap between the income they have and being able to afford the basic needs that they have. Um, the, when you look at the map of the state in this diagram, the lighter colors mean that the county was more economically distressed. So this is a, a distress rating for all of the counties in the state that's based on unemployment rates in that county, the median household income in that county, the percent growth in population, and then the property tax base that comes in in that county. So the lighter colors are higher distressed um, counties, and then the darker colors are a little bit less distressed, but still have you know, economic challenges for many people in that county. So because of all of these things and all of, you know, all of the issues that we're having in our state and in our country, libraries are seeing an increase in patrons who are coming in who have these kinds of needs, who have these psychosocial needs. So there's been, um, a, there's a growing body of research on this that has found that many library patrons have um, unsafe or unstable housing situations, or they're experiencing homelessness. Many library patrons are um, having mental health challenges. They're experiencing substance use and misuse, and sometimes overdoses that are happening in library spaces. 
and experiencing a lot of poverty related needs that they're asking for help or that they need help with. Um, when we look at differences based on housing status, you know, it makes sense that when we see people who have higher housing needs, so they're homeless or they're experiencing highly unsafe or unstable housing, they also tend to have more of these other needs like mental health or substance abuse needs, basic needs, you know, afford it, being able to afford clothing or food or things like that. These needs have been increasing during the time of the pandemic and are expected to continue to increase because of the pandemic. And when we look at these statistics and these, uh, you know, these needs that I'm talking about, most of this comes from needs assessments that have been done in urban and suburban libraries. There really needs to be much more research on rural libraries because we don't have a big body of research on the patron needs and the staff needs in those areas. So I'm going to present, because I, I am a researcher, I do research on this area, so I'm going to present a little bit of my research that has looked specifically at library patron needs in these areas and then library staff needs and what they're seeing with their patron populations. So the first thing I'm going to show you is focused on library patron samples. And in the data I'm going to show you, it looks at three different libraries from two different Midwestern states and asked patrons to self-identify what their unmet or undermet needs were. The original methods were that surveys were placed on the library computer so that people using the computers would be asked if they were willing to, to give their opinion and take a survey. Paper surveys were also available in the library space. And then for two of the three libraries, they also emailed the survey out to their patron email list. So this is the table. If you look at the classification, the numbers at the top and the classification at the top, it tells you the number of patrons that participated in the survey. And then the Metro 1, Metro 2, Metro 3 designation has to do with the size of the community that that library was in. Metro 1 is the largest urban area. Um, Metro 2 and then Metro 3 get to be smaller kind of urban or suburban areas. So that first library, that first column, that was the library that did not email surveys out. So to take the survey, you had to be actually using the library space and either responding on paper or responding on a library computer. Um, the other two, uh, the numbers are a little bit lower because those did go out to email lists. The percentages are lower um, because those did go out to email lists with some patrons that don't even use the library space or use it rel you know, relatively infrequently. But even though these were different kinds of libraries, different kinds of communities, and in some cases, different states, we see some overlap in the patron needs that were expressed. So for all three libraries, one of the top five, so this, the highlighted numbers are the top five needs. For that, the middle library, you'll see six highlighted um, percentages because there was a tie for fifth place with that library. So of, for three of the five, we see that financial needs were in the top category of unmet patron needs, medical and physical health needs, and then employment related needs were in the top five for the patron self-identified needs. For two of the three, mental health needs wound up in the top five, education and literacy wound up in the top five. And then for single libraries, um, transportation and clothing were in that top five list for the first library, and then social connections um, was on the top five list for that middle library. The next thing I'm going to show you are the results from staff surveys about patron needs and what they're seeing. So I have more staff um, samples uh, because of COVID. The patron surveys were not able to be done in some of these libraries because it was during the time that their services were either reduced or they were the space was shut down completely um, for in-person visits. So for the staff needs assessments, there are seven libraries that are represented and they come from three different Midwestern states and then one Eastern state in the US. And these were varying community sizes from pretty large metropolitan or urban areas to non-metropolitan or a rural area for one of these libraries. And these needs assessment surveys were sent out by library administrators to the staff. And then as the researcher, I received the results um, of the survey rather than the administration. So the library administrators distributed the link to the survey, but didn't actually get the results so that people knew their, their responses would be kept um, confidential from administration in those libraries. 
So again, from kind of left to right on this table, we start with more urban areas. The non-metro five area in the far right column is the smallest um, library in this sample. It was a, a relatively rural library, or, although not, not the most um, rural libraries that we have, of course. Um, again, these are varying community sizes, varying types of libraries. Some of these were large library systems with lots of branches, and some of these were single standalone libraries. Um, but despite the differences in the type of library, we see a lot of similarity in the findings. So staff were asked to indicate all of the primary kind of unmet or undermet needs they were seeing in their patron population. So across six of the seven libraries, we see financial needs at the top, mental health needs at the top. For six of the seven, we see housing at the top, substance abuse at the top, and employment at the top. And then we have some kind of standalone responses too for medical and physical health in one library, and then education and literacy in the most rural library, and then social connections for that same library in the right, right column. So outside of, of these needs assessments, there is other data and there's been other research looking at the effect of these changes in patron needs on library staff. And we know widely now at this point that libraries are really feeling the strain from these kinds of changes in their patron needs. Staff are often not trained or qualified to assist with the levels of need that patrons have in their population. Um, staff sometimes feel really conflicted about what their role is even supposed to be with these kinds of patron needs. Patrons with these needs often take up a disproportionate amount of staff time and cause a lot of strain with staff trying to meet the needs of all of the patrons in the library. Some staff fear for their safety or the safety of patrons in the library because of patron behavior that's happening, um, because of mental health challenges or because of some of these other needs. And some libraries actually have to actually frequently call police or security to intervene with patron behaviors that are happening. There also is some growing research looking at the actual experiences of trauma that are experienced by library workers in the course of their job. <clears throat> and what this research has found is that frontline library workers in all types of libraries, rural, urban, and suburban, report high rates of trauma from workplace incidents. So many library workers are experiencing verbal abuse, physical aggression and attacks, and threats of violence or actual violence that's happening in the library. These incidents have increased since the COVID pandemic began, and some library staff actually have um, symptoms of PTSD because of their job or a worsening of a pre-existing mental health condition that they may have because of what they're faced with in their job. COVID, again, has brought an increase in some of these issues. What library staff report since the pandemic is that they're having less patron interaction overall, but when they are having interaction with patrons, in many cases, they are trying to enforce COVID-related restrictions. They're addressing more mental health challenges, poverty-related needs, and other psychosocial needs. They report that they're handling more behavioral issues in the library, that patrons that are coming in are agitated, irritated, and acting out more than they used to. And libraries are seeing an increased emphasis in curbside services, virtual programming, remote programming. So what these things do uh, combined is actually contribute to burnout rates for library staff. So research on burnout has found that anytime you have people who are having less of the things in their job that they found rewarding before, so less patron interaction, less positive interactions with patrons, and you see this increase in pieces of their job that feel really um, either dissatisfying or unnatural or are scary and you know they don't know what's going to happen if they have to talk to a patron about following a policy or something. And anytime you're asking people to, to do things that were different than they used to do before that caused them to have to think about things in a different way or feel an extra stress or strain, we're contributing to burnout rates for people in this profession. So social work in the library is one way that many libraries have attempted to try to meet these kinds of patron needs and also to try to address their staff needs. And there's a growing movement across the US to add social work in the library in different shapes and forms. It looks different in all different libraries. There are lots of different models. I'm gonna talk a little bit about those in just a few minutes. 
Um, this is not to say that libraries are becoming social service organizations. Libraries are still fulfilling their mission to provide information and resources um, to their patron populations, but it focuses on kind of shifting the way we think about reference collections and looking at relationships with community providers um, as a new reference collection or having somebody actually in the library that provides a resource that we can send a patron to. So it makes sense on many different levels for social work and libraries to collaborate. We actually share a lot of overlapping professional values like a commitment to service and serving others and serving the public, a commitment to privacy and confidentiality and protecting people's private information, a commitment to increasing access to accurate information so people can make the most well-informed decisions they need to make for their own lives, a respect for individual rights, um, a focus on professionalism and upholding our professional values and having integrity and carrying out our jobs with integrity. We also both tend to be very focused on social justice and, and again, advocating for people to have access to materials they need to make the best decisions for themselves without um, you know, withholding certain pieces of information and, and, and um, you know, keep preventing people from being able to make the best decisions for themselves. We also complement one another in one really key way. For libraries, the focus is on serving the whole public. For social work, our, our professional focus is on serving the most vulnerable or people who are oppressed in some way. So this is a way we really complement one another well, because if you remember what I said a few minutes ago, one of the things that's happening with the increase in patron psychosocial needs is that it's causing a great deal of strain for staff because of the disproportionate amount of time that people tend to take up when they're asking for help with these needs or when they're presenting with these needs. So when there's social work in the library that can actually help high need patrons with accessing resources and, and answering questions and helping connect them to things in the community, it frees up the library workers time in many cases to make sure that they are able to focus on all of their patrons. So a lot of times I get asked why a social worker? So why is it specifically other than those overlapping values that social work fits well in a library? And why don't we just talk about training librarians to do some of these same kinds of things to help patrons with these kinds of needs? And it has to do with how we're trained. So social workers are trained specifically for what we call generalist environments. And a library is a perfect example of a generalist environment. It means that you have patrons of all ages coming in, patrons with all kinds of issues or challenges who may, you know, one patron might need help with mental health, one might need help with substance use, one might need help with housing, one might have a disability related question or need, um, but we're trained to work in those kinds of environments. We're also trained to work across what we call the micro to macro continuum of services. What has gotten the most attention in the media is the micro focus services. And those are individual, like serving individual patrons, doing assessments, making referrals, helping connect them to services. But we are not only trained to work at the micro level with individuals, we're also trained to work at the macro level with communities and organizations. So all social work education programs are required to train students and prepare students for working at the individual level, level but also working with groups and communities and organizations. And I'll give some uh, more specific examples in a minute of what that looks like in a library space. Another key thing about social workers training is that we are trained to look for the root cause of a problem. So rather, you know, if we have somebody that's coming to us that is asking for connections to housing um, or assistance with finding a job or assistance with signing up for benefits, we are trained to assess and look for what other kinds of issues might be present, whether that's mental health challenges, substance use disorders, you know, other kinds of things that might be contributing to whatever that person is needing or presenting with right now. Um, we also were trained to use interventions, even really short-term interventions, that foster independence and help somebody eventually be able to ideally find resources for themselves, connect with resources by themselves. Um, and we're trained to try to 
to avoid things that might create dependence or you know, make it so somebody needs us on a regular basis to be able to get the services or resources that they need. We also are trained to use clinical skills, even if we're not working in a clinical environment. So again, for all social work programs, it's a requirement that students are trained in a variety of clinical skills. So assessment and how to assess for all of these kinds of needs, understanding the stages of change, which means you know, whether somebody is ready to address something or not. Um, so some people may not even be aware that they have an issue. You know, it's what we used to call denial or something. So some people may not even be aware that they have an issue. And if we try to immediately send them for a service for that issue, they're not going to go right now because they don't even see it as a need. Um, but we are trained to assess the stage of change somebody's in and then to provide different kinds of interventions to help move people along in that change process. We're also trained in motivational interviewing, which is exactly that about moving people along in the stage process and helping get them from what, that denial stage or what we call it now is pre-contemplation, moving them from that stage to where they actually are ready to seek services and access services for something. And we're also trained in brief intervention. So if we're only gonna see somebody one time or we might, maybe they'll come back another time, but we aren't gonna have a long-term relationship with them necessarily. We're trained to try to provide brief interventions for the whatever time we are with somebody. So this is what makes us as a profession a good fit for a library setting. So sample, you know, sample activities that happen with social workers in libraries across that micro to macro continuum are listed here. So those micro focus services, again, are the ones that are getting the most media attention right now. Um, those are when you have a social worker in a library who is meeting with individual patrons, assessing whatever their needs are, making referrals, helping connect them to resources, maybe inter intervening if there's some sort of crisis or somebody has escalated or become upset in the library, but it's all individual focused. At the meso level, which is the medium or in, bet in between level, which is focused on groups and small groups. We're trained to work with groups of people by doing things in libraries like facilitating programming or workshops for patrons on common psychosocial needs and how to, how to access resources and what resources exist for that particular need. We often in libraries are helping to facilitate or bring together non-clinical or mutual aid support groups that might use the library space. We facilitate book groups on books that are focused on psychosocial needs. And we can also do staff training sessions. So we're, we're trained to do those meso or group level interventions. And then at the macro level, which again is the organizational or the community level, social workers in libraries are doing things like um, identifying gaps in services that exist in the community, participating in advisory groups or task forces, um, helping to advocate for funding or increasing services if there are missing services in a community or inadequate services in a community. We can also work with the library administrators to try to create mechanisms for increasing the overall capacity of the library to support patrons long-term with these kinds of psychosocial needs. And we can analyze policies to look for things that might disproportionately impact certain groups of patrons over others. So we can operate at all of these levels and everything here is an example of what a social worker is doing in a library right now in, in various kinds of libraries. So the existing models of library-based social services kind of exist on a continuum. So on the left side of the arrow, you see libraries that have designated personnel in their library who maintain resource lists or who build relationships with other community partners to try to be able to have those partners as referral sources or have those partners come in and do programming or office hours, um, excuse me, or provide information in the library. We do see libraries where they specifically look for community partners who can come in and hold office hours on certain days to do outreach and meet with patrons in the community. Then we have libraries that have social work practicum students or interns who are coming in and doing time limited projects in the library space. And then we have a growing number of libraries on the right side who actually have hired or contracted with full-time or part-time social workers to be in the library primarily. This is a map from a website called the Whole Person Librarianship. Um, that's a map of all known social work and library collaborations across North America 
the kind of fuchsia um, arrow are libraries that have full-time social workers in the library. The orange little pointer are libraries that have other, other social workers or social service providers who are coming in and providing office hours in the library. The green ones are people, libraries that have hired part-time social workers. And then the blue pointers are libraries that have social work students. This map is an underreporting as well. The, the number of collaborations that have popped up even over the past couple months has just greatly increased. And this map relies on libraries to self-report when they have added some sort of collaboration. So um, I know that the folks who maintain the whole person librarianship map are actively trying to seek out and find out information about new partnerships to make sure that this map is an accurate representation. But right now it's the closest thing we have. Um, and there has been a huge increase over the past number, past couple of years in the number of collaborations. And you can see in North Carolina, I know it's really tiny on this map, North Carolina has a number of libraries who have added social work students at this point. So when we see social work in the library, whether it's a full-time social worker or part-time social worker, somebody coming in and having office hours or having students, there are a number of preliminary benefits that we have seen. And at this time, it's really important for you to know there hasn't been any kind of um, really rigorous in-depth outcome evaluation of library social work, mostly because right now all of the positions look a little different. Every library is different. Um, so there hasn't been a, a detailed in-depth outcome evaluation, but these are the things that have come from smaller evaluations and um, surveys or interviews with people. We do see libraries report an increased, um, that they have increased support for staff wellness, that they see a reduction in security calls or calls to police. They have a reduction in the number of patrons that they have to bar or ban from the library. They see an increase in patrons in their library able, who are able to access community services for their needs rather than falling through the cracks like they were before. They see an increase in programming that's developed specifically to meet these kinds of patron psychosocial needs in their, their individual patron group. And they report increased collaborations between their library and other community partners or community social service organizations to help meet these needs. There are a couple barriers that come up pretty consistently with these kinds of collaborations or challenges that come up. The main one that comes up over and over is funding. Um, uh, you know, as, as I'm sure you all know, Libraries are often stretched for funding. They don't necessarily have funds to add a new position. So many libraries are relying on grants to have a social worker either contracted or hired by the library. When those grants end, sometimes there's a challenge to keep the funding, you know, to have sustainability with the position or keep the, keep the position after the funding ends. Also, when relying on a grant, sometimes that restricts what the social worker is able to do because the funding source might require only you know, helping people experiencing homelessness or only focusing on mental health or whatever the focus of that funder is. We also see libraries often try to contract with a partnering social service organization. And this is a way that many libraries have been able to get around the funding challenge. So if they can contract with an organization in their local community who already exists to meet whatever that primary need is in that patron population, um, then sometimes that, that provider can have one of their workers sit in the library certain days of, week, of the week because that helps that provider be able to meet their target population while also meeting the needs of the library. We also see some libraries that have decided to um, fund positions through their general funding of their library or existing resources. And in some cases, libraries have um, decided to forego replacing a librarian position to be able to add a social worker. So, you know, libraries are going about this different ways, but it, funding is definitely a challenge in many different libraries. Liability insurance is also a, a challenge and something that libraries need to think about if they're going in this direction. It needs to be included in the budget if um, the current library policy isn't sufficient to um, cover whatever activities the social worker may be doing. Record keeping is a challenge with these positions um, because of libraries, you know, feeling very strongly about not maintaining any sensitive data or sensitive information about their patron populations. And in many cases, the social worker 
needs to keep minimal records, but needs to keep some records about some of the work they're doing. So there have had to be some creative solutions for how the social worker can maintain the records they need to while not um, violating any standards of that particular library. One of the other challenges with these positions is um, the, just the fact that every library is different. How people make decisions in the library or who has the authority to make decisions is different. Um, how it's funded, whether it's part of the city or the county or funded some other way. You know, every, every library is very different. Every state is very different. Um, and that means in many cases that we're creating these social work collaborations from scratch to fit that particular context. So that makes it a little challenging at first too. And then it's also challenging for the social worker or the social work students because they can be very isolated if they're the only one in a library. And in some cases, they may be the only one in the state. Um, we have to work really hard to help connect them to other people. It's also challenging to figure out who's gonna supervise them. Um, so there are some logistics that have to be worked out sometimes with these kinds of collaborations. Some examples. So I wanna take a few minutes just to talk about some examples. Many people have heard of the first libraries that added social work positions in their library. They're really large, um, unique urban areas. So San Francisco was the very first library that added a social service position. This program has now grown. There's a lead social worker and then six outreach workers who focus on um, homelessness and helping patrons who are experiencing homelessness. Denver was also one of the first public libraries to hire a social worker. They currently have a full-time community resource manager who is a social worker. She supervises three other full-time social workers and then a team of six peer navigators. And again, their focus is on homelessness in that area. And then Washington DC has had a social worker for quite some time. They have a full-time social worker that they call their health and human services manager. So lots of people have heard of at least some of these libraries adding social workers, but it's hard when you look at those communities um, and you look at those patron populations and you look at the size of the library and the size of that budget, it's hard to, it's hard to picture how that might work in other kinds of communities. So I wanna give you some examples of smaller, smaller areas that have added social work positions. So one is Burbank, California, population of 103,000. They added just last summer, a shared social work position that's jointly funded by the library and then the city's parks and rec department. And they share this position between three different libraries and two senior citizen centers. Um, and this social worker rotates between these five different facilities. Most of what she does is focus on outreach to help make people in these different libraries and senior centers feel comfortable being able to ask for things when they do need resources or need help. Um, she meets with individuals, she meets with families, she conducts a lot of assessments, does referrals, but she's also focused on expanding the library's relationship with other organizations in that community. Georgetown Public Library in Texas is a, an area that has a population of 71,000. They had a grant funded social worker whose job was to do the micro and the macro. So he provided assessment and referral to individual patrons in that library. He also worked to identify resource gaps in the community, and he worked with citywide groups to try to advocate for the expansion of social services. Um, he served as a liaison between the city and local nonprofit organizations to help increase collaborations. Now his position did end, the funding ended last year, and so that library no longer has a social worker, but what happened with him was he was actually hired by the State Library um, Commission in Texas. So he's the first social worker now working with the statewide library association in, in um, Texas. Rochester Public Library in Minnesota is a population, they have a population of 115,000. They have a new social work position there that's a partnership with a local nonprofit organization. Um, so the social worker is actually hired by that nonprofit organization, but she spends 25 hours a week in the library working in what they've created as a wellness corner. So she sits there, she focuses on providing support and referrals for individual patrons, um, mostly focusing on housing and food resources, as well as other social services that might be needed. And she does some long-term case management or follow-up with patrons as needed. 
looking at more rural libraries, there are a couple rural libraries that have added social work in their library. The first one was Niles Public Library in Michigan. This is a rural area with a population of under 12,000 people. It was the first known rural library to add social work services. They actually received a grant to hire a full-time social services manager who supervised a group of social work interns. Um, she also worked really hard to train and um, really establish what social work could look like in rural libraries and train other rural libraries about how they could do that or provide information about how they could do that. Um, unfortunately, that position ended. So that, again, is a, a demonstration of what I was talking about earlier with the challenges of grant-funded positions. Um, many times they're not sustainable after the funding ends. And then Union County, South Carolina is a rural area with a population of under 8,000 people. They have a really unique situation in their library where the assistant director in the library is actually a social worker and um, was hired specifically so she would work doing general library administration. She supervises other staff. She oversees policy and practice um, related decisions. Um, supervises volunteers, but she also maintains a caseload. She actually sees individual patrons, provides services to them. Um, that community didn't have very many other community resources, so the library and the social worker have decided to um, start a food bank in the library. And she also collaborates with other organizations in the community to try to look for gaps and ways that they can address the gaps collaboratively. So in many cases, these library social workers are doing a variety of different kinds of responsibilities, um, but they are often working, you know, some at the micro lo level with individuals, but also some at the organizational or the community level. Um, another way that many libraries have decided to add social work, especially if they're just sort of taking a step in this direction, they're trying to gather data to see whether they can um, make a case for funding long-term, some sort of social work position. So that first step is often to have social work students in the library. This costs sometimes nothing, sometimes a little bit, depending on the structure of that school of social work and whether uh, there has to be some funding to pay for the social work supervisor. Um, but this works in many libraries if there's a social work school close by. It is inexpensive and students can do many of the things that I was describing earlier, many of those examples of micro, mezzo or macro level services. But there are a number of challenges that have to be faced when a library is focusing or relying on um, students to do these services. One of course is just frequent turnover. It takes a while for students to be trained um, about the library, the library context and kind of figure out their role. And then, uh, you know, they're only gonna be there for one semester or maybe two semesters and they move on and you have to do it again with new students. Sometimes there are also gaps between student placements. So a school may not have students every single semester. Maybe they only place students in their practicum for fall and spring or only spring or only summer. Um, and so you may have gaps between students and you can't necessarily rely on them uh, consistently. Um, students cannot operate independently. So some of the higher level things that you'd get from a, um, a professional social worker, you can't rely on a student for those same kinds of things. They're gonna need supervision. They're gonna need a lot of guidance. Um, they can't do all of the same things that a professional social worker could do. One of the big challenges is that piece around supervision. So who's gonna supervise them? Can the school provide a social work supervisor or would the library be responsible for that? Um, even when there's a supervisor, it's somebody externally who only sees the student, you know, sometimes one hour a week, sometimes a little bit more. But you know, again, students aren't closely supervised. So in some cases that can be challenging unless there's somebody who really can operate independently. Um, some social work programs have specializations that make the program not a great fit for library settings. Again, usually uh, in a social work program, students have to do a generalist placement and then they do a specialized placement if the program specializes in something. So usually you still see students at some point who have to do that generalist placement, but they may have lots of students who can't or aren't appropriate for a library setting at that specialized level. And then, of course, many libraries aren't close to the social work program or that's not a possibility for them. Um, we do see more and more collaborations happening. So I, this is the way I sort of think, see things moving in the future, because most individual libraries 
struggle with um, whether we're talking about funding for hiring a social worker or contracting with a social worker or may not have um, enough of, uh, you know, enough patron needs to feel like they need a full-time person. And so we're seeing more and more collaborations between groups of libraries. And I highlighted some of those uh, a little bit earlier with the paid positions, but we see that also with students. So the example on this slide is from Pennsylvania where there is um, a library associ association that's 40, made up of 46 public libraries through 70 locations in Allegheny County. And these are all independent libraries with their own boards of directors, um, but they have joined together and created a consortium and they actually got funding together to pay interns um, for some of their time in the library and to pay for the supervision that they needed. So this is a program where libraries are joining together for social work students. So I do see us sort of heading more in that direction um, where more and more libraries will be uh, collaborating to try to um, either fund positions or figure out how to contract together and share some sort of position or students in the library. So um, if you want to know more about this, um, there is time for some questions, but you can contact me. I'll, these slides will be sent out, I think, Amelia, um, to participants. So you'll have the links, but you can contact me here at UNC Charlotte or through my consulting organization, which is Beth Waller Consulting. If you also are interested in other information, the Whole Person Librarianship website is a good place to start, or there also is a website focused to social works, focused on social work students and public libraries. So if there are any questions, I'll take them now. Folks, feel free to unmute um, or you can use chat to enter your questions, whichever uh, format you'd like. Is anyone currently working at a library system where you have social workers or you're working on, you know, heading in that direction? Hi everyone, um, this is Lisa Montgomery from um, Melbourne, Florida. And actually I'm brand new to this whole library social work uh, experience and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. We just started in uh, January here in Melbourne, Florida. And I work out of uh, four different libraries that were pre-selected as, uh, as having a particular need for social work services. And um, it, this is brand new for me. So yeah, so I'm creating it as I'm going and um, I am curious and it is grant funded. It ends in September and it is well, very much appreciated by the staff as well as the community. But um, my question is, you know, I'm seeing more and more of this type of need in the community what has been effective in getting the larger community to be more accepting and willing to fund these types of uh, services? Yeah, I mean, funding is a huge challenge. And we also have in many communities, some, actually probably all of our communities, we see um, disparities between uh, the groups of people who have higher incomes often, um, who are either you know, paying property taxes or are you know, somehow contributing to the budget that becomes the library's budget. So we see sort of a disparity between that group and then the group of these really high needs, vulnerable patrons who depend on the library for services and may not have anywhere else to go to get help or for a warm, you know, a warm place in the winter, a cool place in the summer or um, for connection to resources or to use the computer or use the Wi-Fi. And so it is a challenge in many places to help um, really bring those two groups of people together and help, um, you know, the people who have more resources to feel committed to making the um, library a safe place for all and a welcoming place for, for all. Um, and in fact, in some of my research on library patrons, there are sometimes really hateful remarks that are made by 
um, kind of more resourced, higher resourced patrons against um, some of the other patrons that are using the library space. So, you know, I do think it's a challenge. One of the, one of the ways that's been successful to help um, get more, in some cases, more funding from the city or the, count, or the county or whoever's funding the library for these kinds of services is to gather data in some way about the number of patrons that are being served that have these issues. So a large part of what I do in my research and in my consulting business um, are needs assessments, but it's another, it's, a, it's also something that can be done. And so if your library or your library system is already moved in this direction of hiring a social worker or contracting with social worker or having social work students, those people can also gather data about the number of patrons with these kinds of issues, the number of um, referrals they're needing to make, the number of things that they're doing that can then be used to try to justify increases in funding. Because I find that the general, the general public doesn't understand what, um, doesn't, often doesn't understand what social work does, but often has no idea what's going on in public libraries. And there still are so many people who think a library is this quiet place where you know, somebody's walking around shushing everyone and people are checking out books and they don't realize that libraries really have become these community centers and um, are, are serving so many needs and, and helping their community in so, in so many ways. And these needs assessments or gathering data of different kinds can help make that case um, that can then uh, result in some more long-term funding. Thank you. Yes, I was one of those people who did not use, did not realize that the library was used in that capacity. And I did think it was one of those pieces where you just showed up, checked out a book and called it a day. Yeah. So thank you. And I did enjoy your research. Thanks, Lisa. Naomi, I think you have your hand up. Oh, yes. Um, I just wanted to kind of um, let you know what we've been doing here. I work for the NDPL system in Indianapolis and um, we just hired our first social worker yeah. last year. It's been amazing, very resourceful. Um, she's been, um, and now we have interns here too who just completed an assessment for our branch and it was very enlightening. Um, and so I do, well, working since 1998 in the library from a page to a manager, you know, I've seen services change. Even like the guy mentioned, I didn't go to library school to, um, you know, distribute Narcan and, um, take AED training and all these things that we do now. And I'm just realizing that our services have just changed um, because um, the vulnerable patron population has grown um, tremendously so. So to kind of combat that, we started a community pantry that is completely donated from our community partners. Um, we started hygiene kits in our bathrooms. Um, and we have all kinds of community partners that come in from Assurance Wireless to hand out government phones, the free phones, and they come three times a week. We have a vaccine clinic going on right now. Um, and then we just wrapped up our Vita tax services. Um, we house that there um, here this year. And then we have the Damien Center with HIV awareness. They come and set up a table twice a week and they stock our free condoms. So we, our services have just changed and we have to still really strive to meet the needs of the community, no matter what that is, summer reading program, story times, and like this other additional things that they need. Yeah, it is hard and it has, it has huge implications for um, like MLIS programs and, and um, the education that people need to have when they're going to go into public library work because things don't look the same in a public library as they did 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And, and I, I don't know, you know, it's always a challenge on the educational side. And I know, you know, from a social work perspective with my own social work program, it's hard at times um, to keep up with the changing needs and to change the program to make sure that our graduates are able to um, effectively do the work once they're out in the field. So I know it's, you know, it's the same on the library and information science side as well. Um, but I, you know, there are, I think there, we see a group of, and it shows up in my staff surveys with people working in libraries. There always is a group who um, says, I don't think this is the library's role. This isn't why I got into this work. Um, that, that group is shrinking though in needs assessments. 
Um, and I, I think that people by and large are realizing that public library work has shifted. And, and so, you know, we, there also are more and more um, MLIS programs that are adding mm -hmm. a social work class or, a, you know, some sort of, like there's a program right now that's adding um, a certificate program in library social work. There are a couple joint degree programs in library. So library, you know, library and information science and social work. Um, so I think more and more programs are adding at least classes or components to try to prepare people for the way the field actually looks, but it, it, that is a challenge. I agree. I feel like we've always as library workers have tried to bridge gaps and, um, and build up our community, but um, the need has grown so much. So I think that's the stressful part of it. And we just have to find the support in our community partners to really combat this on a different level. All right. Um, well, we are unfortunately at time, and I know that you may have some additional questions or want to learn more, um, but we will be sharing the recording, the slides, um, as well as Beth's contact information. Um, I'm sure she'd love to hear from you and talk more, um, but please join me in thanking Beth Waller so much for her time today for this presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me for this. And please do read any.